and I've got lots of other folks signing on. Awesome. All right, well, just um, let me quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Eric Lopatin. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Infrastructure Interest Group, and uh, I'm at uh, CDL, California Digital Library, and Robin and I have been uh, co-chairing this year. Robin, do you want to do a quick introduction? Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Regaber from the University of Virginia, and I work as the Director of Strategic Technology Partnerships and Initiatives. And I've been involved with NDSA for know, maybe since about 2012 or so, 2011, but um, involved in the infrastructure group and was involved with DigiPress planning this year, which I'd recommend to anyone who wants to get involved. All right, and um, <clears throat> let's see if we have two folks who are joining us for the first time. And um, uh, Todd, could I ask you to introduce yourself really quick? Sure, sure. I'm Todd Digby. I'm the uh, at the University of Florida, and I am the department chair for library technology services here. So one of our one of our roles is the oversight and development of our digital library system and digital archives initiatives. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and Ema, could you introduce yourself as well? Hi, I'm Ema Adwa. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the uh, digital librarian with Texas Digital Library. Um, I just started this position in September, so I'm kind of new and just kind of getting feel of the layout of digital librarianship and digital preservation work. Awesome. Thanks. Welcome. All right, and let's see, it looks like everyone else is has added their name to the, to the list here. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, so this, you know, this meeting is <clears throat> uh, in a format that we have tried last year and um, uh, had some good success with. Uh, it's essentially like an open, open slate where folks can bring um, any sort of challenge that they have going on at their own organization, uh, bring that to the forefront to other folks attending the meeting, and uh, we can uh, pretty much go through and offer input from our own experiences to what might be applicable to that challenge that uh, that you're having at your organization, and uh, bounce around ideas and see what we can come up with and see what's helpful. So um, I think, the last time we did this, we actually had somebody who was just setting up a um, repository and a service for research data sets. So that was an interesting conversation. Um, and we talked a lot about infrastructure in the sense of uh, requirements for you know their project. Um, but yeah, I'd like to go ahead and um, open up the, uh, the table for that. And then um, just in general, uh, for the rest of the meeting, we'll also talk about um, next year's meeting dates. And then uh, we should we could spend some time um, brainstorming on topics for next year. Um, because I think some uh, people had a chance to join us at DigiPres, um, but a lot of uh, people were um, are just attending meetings online. So it'd be awesome to actually get everyone's input on possible topics for next year or so. Um, but with that, uh, yeah, I, I would invite anyone here to um, mention any project or uh, work that you're doing at your organization uh, that might um, be helpful to have some comments from the group uh, chime in. So I can say um, one thing that uh, that we're finding challenging at CDL. I could go there um, and maybe get some uh, some feedback from you all on that. Um, but uh, I'll wait a couple more minutes. Or Robin, I don't know if you had anything else to mention. I don't right now. I mean, things are pretty quiet right now for us. So. 
I think the uh, new announcement about research data is posing a lot of questions about where we store data and people are still trying to figure out what the mandate is for research data. Right, and we've had a lot of um, a lot of discussion here, um, not necessarily like within the team that I work on, but at other teams uh, at CDL um, with regard to um, protected and sensitive information and research data, and uh, the whether or not we have a solution to um, provide to the University of California campuses for that, which we we don't at the moment. Um, in fact, all the campuses have uh, out of out of the the ten campuses, six of them have had a um, you know need to find their own solution, uh, which is not necessarily like preservation worthy for that data, um, and they've spent a lot of time on trying to configure their own services or buying into other services or spending money on a monthly basis for managing that data. So um, yeah, we that is there's definitely a large discussion and a large project at some point in the future. Um, so we have this, we have a, a group that actually uh, has representation from each campus um, that meets on a regular basis uh, called the Digital Preservation Leadership Group. And um, that has landed squarely on our plate to, to dissect this year. So we will see where it goes. Yeah, Hillary. Hi, um, I'm Hillary. I'm the digital archivist at Brown University. Um, I'm somewhat new to the position. I started in August. But one of the things we're talking about right now is how to provide access to our born digital materials in the special collections. Um, they're just starting to kind of ramp up co special collections in this area. And so then, of course, the conversation is, well, how do we even provide access to these materials? And so we're just kind of curious because I have seen some other examples out there of like using Quick Viewer Plus or Pro um, on like laptops. So I'm just curious how people have been managing, you know, say you have 60 gigabytes, right, of born digital material in a hybrid collection that's been described in a finding aid are people when someone requests access and you can't email them a copy and they have to come in on site how are people providing access to those um, files if anyone has a use case that'd be really helpful I see Scott raised his hand. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Hi. Um, let me start my video. So uh, we we have this uh, case also, and um, we have actually uh, two different uh, things going on. And uh, what we're doing is actually very similar to the, something that Dan Noonan at Ohio State University, I'm sorry, the Ohio State University is uh, working on also. <laughs> and um, uh, so one thing is we have uh, what we're calling a secure digital shelf, where uh, we're putting uh, digitized and born digital materials uh, that are not uh, available for public view, but are part of like archives, special collections that only staff have access to, but uh, staff can get at these things. And then what our archives is set up is a uh, computer in a uh, <clears throat> on premises where people uh, can sit down and view these materials, but the computer has been very uh, locked down that they you can't put in a USB key. It doesn't have any internet connection. Um, it's been fairly secured so that they can only view the uh, materials there on site uh, on the computer. Both of these things are still under development. We haven't uh, actually rolled it out yet, but they are they're, they're the path that we're going down. Thanks, Scott. 
And I see Carol just um, added a note uh, to the discussion. Let me read that. Yeah, Carol mentioned. Uh, oh. Yeah, sorry, Eric. Yep. Um, this is Go Carol. Ahead. Yeah, we just have a computer in our reading room. It doesn't get used very often. We're still kind of in the people need to find it, our electronic materials on our finding aids <laughs> in order to know they can have access. Um, but most of the time we just load the materials onto the computer for their use. So if they're coming in for a day or a week, um, the materials just get loaded on. I know we've had like a collection of 500 gigs, so it takes a while sometimes to load it on there. Um, and for a while the computer would get wiped every night, which was always fun because we'd have to reload the materials. Um, but we haven't had to use QuickView Plus yet um, it's something we're thinking about but because of the licensing we haven't purchased that for that computer yet since the access is fairly limited so but it's locked down like scott's is so no copying can i ask just on like a very specific like how do you lock it down so that there's no copying besides just like no like thumb drives or no internet connection our it's ours is in a locked box so they can't get to anything pretty much except for the keyboard so they can't plug in any thumb drives they don't have access to any of the ports so it's actually in a locked box <laughs> yeah and, uh, um we still haven't worked out the details yet with how our archives is using theirs but the idea is uh putting something like a kiosk you know, basically a computer in a locked box with no controls on it, except perhaps like a um, a UI navigation control. And at Ohio State during the pandemic to be able to provide access to things as they developed a secure virtual reading room, where it's uh, essentially you, I think it's a VPN into it, um, but it's, but once again, it's like, it's almost in some sense like a dumb terminal where you can work with and look at the materials, but you can't do any copying, you can't do any saving. Um, and I mean, if it's uh, that's something that you, folks are interested in, I would have to put you in touch with Terry Reese, our um, head of um, digital initiatives that developed that that um, process for us. I don't know enough about the technical background of it, but we have that capability. I think as Scott was alluding to before is that when we get our new repository up and running, that will be one of the options for providing access to some of the materials if there is concerns about privacy, um, identifiable information, things of that nature, um, versus um, stuff that we could simply just download and hand over to folks. Um, and we have talked about the notion of actually putting a terminal within the reading room that's a secured reading room terminal, um, although you could also do that all virtualized too. Robin, you're going to mention something? Yeah, we've done pretty much the same thing. We have a dedicated computer, I think actually two, in our reading room, and no one else can discover those rare uh, materials that you can only look at in the reading room except from those terminals. And um, there might be like a finding aid or something that would mention things so that you know to come in but you can't get to them any other way. And all of that's locked down, I think, on a private network that we have within that building. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really helpful. We've been going back and forth of all these like potential scenarios and like thinking who would actually do the labor of, yeah, like copying the files onto a hard drive and then uploading it onto the reading room computer and like what's the schedule of wiping it and all those. So this is really helpful to think about. Thank you. Yeah, well, the other thing, the like, oh, sorry, you go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say is that's that's one of the other things that happens with the virtual reading room is once that session closed, that automatically wipes everything that's in there. So it's kind of like, you know, when you, you some of the user experience that, that people have, like when they walk in a library and use a common terminal, they can log in using university ID. But once they log out, everything is wiped on, 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 on the, the exit. So. Right. I'm also... In case we make people actually then request the items. I don't even think we load it up on the computer.
And I see um, Carol also mentioned there's like no internet access in their space. So there's no way for the person who's viewing the material to email themselves. Um, and then um, Chelsea mentioned, I recall seeing a presentation regarding virtual reading rooms from the Lighting the Way project. It's on page 141 of um, Project Handbook. Thanks for the link. Let's see. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, that conversation, everyone. And thanks, yeah. Uh, thanks, Hillary, for mentioning it. Uh, John mentioned, I wonder if this screen capture W3C group might be of interest for digital preservation. Let's see what that is. Yeah, they're um, they're doing um, some kind of, um, they have a number of, uh, they're asking for votes on whether this interest group should start up and you know, it'll likely be approved, I guess, but I didn't see preservation as part of it. And um, I've often wanted to, you know, given how slippery, you know, the experience of digital uh, information is quite often, you know, the, um, if you could just grab a sc screen capture uh, and, and of an entire document, even the part that scrolled off the bottom of your screen, sometimes I think that would, um go a long way to just like you know fossil, fossilizing the the bit that uh, is really important so, thanks john i don't know what this community thinks but it's good to trade ideas All right, so let's see. Um, does anyone else have a project or challenge they want to bring forward to the group? I have one. Um, this is Adrienne. I'm at University of Georgia. Uh, we have our preservation storage is all local. We have about 900 terabytes at the moment. And we're trying to think about how do we get a geographically dispersed copy of it um, while keeping it semi-affordable given its size. So I wonder if folks either have leads on, you know, an affordable place to stash stuff or thoughts more philosophically and kind of what are your minimum requirements for storage to be considered preservation storage? You know, we have good replication, pixie checking and such on our copies here. So what could we give up to get something more economical to get a copy in a different state? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I would um, <clears throat> mention uh, a recent um, encounter of ours uh, CDL with our preservation system. Um, and I, I will say recent because there's a, a recent detail of us that's kind of uh, thrown us a bit for a bit of a loop, um, but we've had a good experience so far with um, uh, with Wasabi cloud storage. Um, in fact, uh, the reason we well, one of the reasons we went with them is because uh, we needed a, uh, a third copy of our content um, in a different geographic location and um, Wasabi's on these, they have data centers on the East Coast in Manassas, Virginia, and um, they have very reasonable storage costs in terms of cost per terabyte per year and no transaction charges for like actually, you know, I, when it comes to like downloading your content or anything like that, they also have a pretty reasonable like um, uh, policy when it comes to deleting the content um, from their system as an exit strategy. So your content doesn't have to be there for more than I think basically three months, at which point you can begin to delete it if you don't want to have it there. But um, yeah, and Adrian, I, uh, or Chelsea, I see your raised hand, I'll be, I'll be done in a minute. Um, so yeah, the one thing that we have encountered with them recently is that we need support for four byte characters. And um, when we establish our um, 
contract with them initially, the bucket that we had our content in did not support four byte characters. And it wasn't until maybe a year later where we had one object that had a four byte character in it and the key. And um, we weren't able to do anything aside from contact the original depositor and try to change the actual file name, which was not what we wanted to do. Um, so we are looking into a service that Wasabi now offers, which is to replicate um, their they, they can replicate your content from a bucket, a legacy bucket, into a bucket that does actually support four by characters, which is great. So um, we're right uh, at that point where we are um, engaging their support and sales teams to find out exactly what that looks like for, for our storage, which is um, about uh, 350 terabytes of secondary copies that we store at Wasabi. So I can follow up with folks on that just to let them know how it goes. But. Um, yeah, Chelsea, thanks for raising your Yeah, hand. of course. Um, I also am a plus one for Wasabi uh, in the world of the of cloud storage. Um, I would also, because um, Adrian, I think you said you were at the University of Georgia, um, I would also point to the Alabama Digital Preservation Network. So even though Alabama is in their name. They're a private locks network that um, provides services to universities across the Southeast. So um, I would also point you in that direction if you're interested. That's all. Awesome, thank you. I didn't know they yeah. did other than Alabama. Yeah, I think they just had a member join from Mississippi. So they're starting to grow um, beyond Alabama. And I know they're looking for folks from other states. So maybe this is a great test case. Great, and um, Scott. Yeah, just have a question. Um, how much how much you're planning on uh, storing or what your growth is expected? You know, are we talking like dozens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes? And then the other question that's sort of related is what's economical in your view and what's, um, you know, what would be considered expensive? Uh, we use AWS Deep Glacier uh, for secondary um, preservation, and we have about 30 terabytes in there right now. And I think we're getting charged like around $250 a month, which, you know, to us, seems like that's about the amount of that we're storing will go up more terabytes, but in that scale. And that to us is cheap, but, you know, your situation may differ. I'd like to know a little bit more about how much and what kind of money you're dealing with. Yeah, so... So our scale, we have 900 terabytes now. We grow about 20 terabytes a month. One of our archives is a media archive, so they're constantly scanning. Um, and in terms of budget, um, our administration hasn't, hasn't set aside separate funds for this. So it's more, I need to find the cheapest thing that is still ethical and then try to advocate for them to find that money um, from our general fund. So okay. thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands a year, but you know, as as cheap as I can get it, basically. Okay. <laughs> but we don't have a sense of what's reasonable. Right. Thank you. And and Robin, I saw you mentioned AP Trust. Yeah, so I put something in there about AP Trust and um, Bradley Daigle. I mean, we're really with AP Trust not competitive, I would say, in terms of like competing with other solutions. So, you know, Bradley would be glad to talk to you about the cost model and all the different storage options, which include Wasabi with AP Trust. And also, he's just a good person to bounce ideas off of and he has a lot of knowledge about different preservation storage solutions so i'd really recommend reaching out uh, to him whether or not you're interested in going with ap trust thank you all right you know i, I saw um don you mentioned uh 
the Wasabi cost, yeah, we're we're at about that same price point for 100 terabytes each year, around 7,500. Um, and yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I'm uh, wondering um, when you when you talk about preservation storage, is this is this intended for a dark archival copy, or is there um, are there any uh, you, do you need to be able to do some sort of online delivery directly from this storage? Uh, yeah, this is a this is the dark uh, disaster recovery. A tornado has come through Athens and destroyed both buildings where we currently have the more near line copies. Um, so it can be um, it can't be prohibitively expensive to get out. I think that was one of our concerns with Deep Glacier. If we did have that catastrophe and needed to pull pull everything, that that was going to become a problem. But um, but we'd only need to get it back if it was an absolute something went horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the the absolute least expensive um, uh, storage that that we work with is through the uh, the USC digital repository, which is been optimized for very very large scale um, audiovisual materials. It's uh, it's dark. It's you know, near line, offline tape, um, but it's extremely inexpensive. It's um, it's eight hundred dollars a terabyte for twenty years. So I can't do the math in my head to what that works out on an annual basis. But that's that's the least expensive thing that we've been able to find um, that we would consider, you know, um, appropriate for for that service function. Stephen, would you mind noting that in the in the chat? Oh, uh, sure. Great, thanks. And then I saw Emad mentioned TDL offers digital preservation storage in Chronopolis, uh, Amazon S3, and Glacier. Yeah, uh, totally agreed, Scott. Yeah, the twenty-year, twenty-year pricing model is definitely convenient. Yeah, I mean, it means you do have to come up with a big, a big chunk of you know funds that first year, um, which you know, might be more than you would normally expect if you were anticipating an annual basis. But if if you, you know, amortize it over the twenty years, if you're able to do that, then it becomes extremely, uh, extremely low cost. Right, right. Great. Well, thanks right, and, for um, all those ideas. And Stefano? Hi, I'm Stefano from uh, Harvard. I work with uh, Stephen on the uh, digital repository. Um, in terms of uh, disaster recovery from deep archive or dark archive, uh, how much of a factor is the readiness factor? So the time that it takes me to recover like a large portion or a whole archive from a complete meltdown, is that something that you count in when you budget it? Or when um, disaster happens, you, know, you just go for, you just brace yourself and whatever times are for recovery, it's, that's it. We figure it will take a while. Um, you know, if something that bad, has, this is, you know, this is our special collection. So it's for research, um, but nobody's life is on the line if they can't get access to the data in the next month or whatever. So we'll just recover as fast as we can in the event that something goes this wrong. It would mean both our special collections building and our main library building were probably destroyed. So we'd have a lot of rebuilding to do beyond just getting this data back. So we also felt like it was important to try to take the step to have that protective copy since that is something we can do um, that is physically possible as opposed to, you know, we can't do anything about our paper collections. We can't get a copy of them anywhere else.
All right, well, I'm going to make an effort to uh, capture all of our notes in the running notes document so we can all go back to all these great suggestions. Thanks, everyone. All right, and okay, and I'll let's go ahead and uh, we we do um, we do want to mention the dates for next year and do a little brainstorming on topics for next year. But um, uh, we're at about twelve thirty-five. Just wanted to see if there's anyone else who wanted to bring a um, uh, challenger project uh, to the table. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, I did want to mention um, one of the one of the challenges we're having at uh, at CDL with our repository is, um, is is the notion of determining uh, what the optimal performance for the repository is in terms of uh, the rate of content ingest. And um, this stems from, uh, you know, us trying to work with the campuses to, to determine about how much content they might want to ingest into our system over the, the forthcoming fiscal year. And it's, you know, it's, it's a very, when we reach out to um, our contacts at each of the campuses, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex question or it's a complex answer, um, essentially. It's a simple question, complex answer. Uh, because most most units, most libraries do not know how much they will really have the bandwidth to um, contribute to the repository. And um, you know, with the exception of maybe one or two campuses that have a lot of bandwidth and they have a you know a roadmap in front of them. And um, you know, those are those are those are the exceptions to the rule. Um, and what we would love to be able to do is actually say, okay, in an ideal world, we know that um, we were expecting was just a number out of this out of the sky here. Let's say we're expecting you know 125 terabytes or something from from all the campuses across the entire year um, at any given time, and we know that the repository can you know ingest a certain number of terabytes per day if we're really under like duress. Um, you know, maybe two or three terabytes a day, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, the perfect storm says, okay, well, maybe multiple campuses are submitting content. But, you know, on the other hand, we have to look at all the compute resources that are being used to ingest that content. And do we, do we just keep trying to build out the system so it can process more and more content per day? That doesn't make sense to us. What we really want to be able to say is, let's draw the line at four terabytes a day. What does that mean for compute resources? What does that mean for, um, uh, you know, storage and every part of the system, fixity checking? What does it mean for a fixity check cycle? All that sort of thing. So it's just, you know, it's. I guess I'm mentioning it because it's a. a it's something where we need a lot of data or a lot of metrics that you know, tell us what we can expect and what we should do. And then, of course, we also have to look at our budget. So um, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of curious if anybody else has come across, has, has kind of come up against that, where they're saying, OK, well, we need to, you know, we're trying to optimize this to, the system as best we can, but we realize we have, you know, a, a certain budget we need to follow. What does optimal performance of the system really mean? Um, because, you know, it's, I'm sure it would be, you know, relatively accepted by anyone who's trying to deposit something to say to them, okay, well, it will be a few days before that content actually has a chance to process and ingest. Um, I don't, I've, in my experience, I've not heard of anyone like literally saying, no, that's not fast enough. Um, so yeah, anyway, I wanted to throw that out there and see if anyone had any uh, comments on that.
Uh, Eric, so what what are what exactly are you trying to optimize? I mean, it seems to me there's there's at least three dimensions you could do independently or in combination, which is uh, network throughput, um, storage capacity, and CPU utilization. Um, I mean, it seems to me, you know, if you had enough staging space to build up a queue, you know, as long as it eventually gets cleared, um, you know, whatever eventually means, um, you could ignore the network and the CPU. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, that's a really good point. We recently switched to using uh, Amazon's flavor of ZFS storage for the staging or queuing area for the system. And that storage needs to be um, we basically have to say we will we want X amount of space uh, it has to be set ahead of time. Um, so we have this kind of rotating space or this space where let's say we have 10 terabytes of that ZFS available to at any uh, at any given time. Um, if we go over it, then you know we have to we'll end up you know slowing down in terms of the network bandwidth and everything like that. Um, if we underutilize it, of course, then we're paying more money than we really want. Um, so yeah, that kind of becomes a question of how much do we spend on that storage for the staging environment? Um, and it's a really good question. That's something we've been thinking about as well. Yeah, we, we also um, are currently still using um, you know fixed storage capacity for, for, uh, for stage in just staging, but for a lot of the same reasons you just enumerated, we're, we're strongly looking at trying to switch that over to an S3 bucket, um, which was, you know, easily expandable up and down. And, you know, you're paying dearly, but only for what you're actually using at any given point in time. Right. Right. And that's, you know, we, before we, started using ZFS, we were using EFS. And the that was, you know, the elastic file system is great because, you know, you you feel like you're never really, you know, it adjusts accordingly. Um, and you're paying for a certain standard like bandwidth, um, you know, IO that you can raise or lower um, based on your needs. And what we ended up seeing is that, you know, if we started to really crank up the available IO, it became really expensive. Um, and that also kind of led us to this discussion of, well, you know, do we, do we need that kind of IO? Can we survive with less, um, even while contents like queuing up? So, um, I think we we're we're running the ZFS experiment and, um, We'll see, like, cost-wise, what it's going to look like over the course of maybe six months or something. But, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for chatting about that. I appreciate it. Um, so why don't we, is there, well, let me just ask, is, is, does anyone else want to mention anything else before we keep going? Because we can, we could uh, start to talk about just uh, our dates for next year and doing a little brainstorming. Okay. All right, well, just to quickly um, mention the dates for next year. So we are continuing with this uh, quarterly meeting schedule. And um, I think, uh, you know, we really value your input on the, the meeting schedule that we're establishing. Um, this will be the first whole year that NDSA um, actually schedules its interest groups uh, quarterly. So, um, but if you do have input, like if you would rather see the the groups meet more often or have a different um, kind of like a, another way of communicating or bringing up new topics or maybe even meeting at you know ad hoc 
Um, and we're always open to that feedback. So, um, but just to mention uh, on our main infrastructure page, we have, let me drop a link there for that. Uh, we've got our meeting set up. The first one for 2023 is on March 20th. And then uh, we've got one in June on 26th, which is uh, a week later than normal um, because of um, observing the Juneteenth holiday. Uh, and then um, we've got one on September 18th and then December 18th. So those are, those are our meeting dates for next year. Eric, oh. I didn't really realize, but um, September 18th is on the Monday before I press is that week, the 19th through the 22nd. And because it's going to be in Illinois this year, people may want to go to that. And so I think the Monday might make it hard. So we might want to push that date to a week later as well. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe we'll end, we should do that. Would people be, I mean, does anybody have an objection to us making it a week later than the 18th? That would put it on the 25th of September. There's the VRA conference that day. I don't know what community sees that, but that's what's on DLF's calendar right now. But no other conflicts on that one. I'm wondering if it would be good to do it a week earlier, because a lot of us will probably be going to IPRES, and it might be good to have a conversation that we can continue with each other while we're at IPRES if we talk the week before. Yeah, that's a really good idea, too. Is, is the fourth Labor Day? Oh, uh, no, that would be the 11th. The 11th would work. Mm -hmm. You just need to do an hour earlier or later, I think. But we can deal with that for the DLF Zoom. Oh. Sounds good. All right. Um, OK, so we'll get those set up and um, and yeah, thanks, Carol. Appreciate it. Yep, won't get changed for a couple of weeks. They're gone. <laughs> DLF is gone. <laughs> we can do that. All right. So, in terms of um, topics for next year, uh, what we tend to do is we and we tend to. Um, set up a an online poll for people to add topics to, and um, I can definitely do that again this year because um, we have our our four meetings. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to to see since we're a little bit more limited uh, in terms of meeting times, if anybody has um, specific input on what they would like to see the group talk about next year at one of those meetings. All right, what we can do is, oh, sorry about that if you overheard my neighbor's dog. Um, what we can do is we can put that poll out there with uh, a few topics on it. And um, I will send a link via the uh, via the list email, the, um, the listserv, so people can go out to that page and have a look. Um, and we can kind of piecemeal it that way. Oh, and I wanted to, okay, yeah. So Stephen, um, I know you had mentioned Andrew Woods had a talk at CNI last week, was it? About um, the DRS? Uh, yes, yes he did. Okay. 
Uh, I still want to take it. Do you know if they made that or they're making that recording available? I assume that they will be. That's that's been their practice in, in the past. Okay. Um, I, I didn't speak up just now. I wanted to could go back and consult with with Stefano and my other colleagues about. I, mean, I think at some point we would we would be very happy to uh, give a short presentation on the work that we're doing. Uh, for the others who don't haven't heard this before, we're we're engaged in a big multi year project to uh, completely would do a, a generational modernization of our preservation repository infrastructure. Um, and uh, we would be happy to uh, present an interim status update on both our plans and, and where we've gotten to and so forth at some point. I just don't know at what point in the year it would be most appropriate. So that's why I didn't, uh, I didn't say anything right away, but I'll, once, once you put up that uh, poll page, we can, uh, we can, we can put something on there. Okay, yeah, that, would, that sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stephen, I'm also wondering, I know that um, Andrew, who did a presentation on the environmentally, more environmentally aware storage that you guys are using. And I wondered if, uh, you know, data centers that are more like more efficient with the energy is another topic that we might put out there for discussion. Or maybe that could be a research kind of thing we do. I don't know. Right. And um, I know that in this past year, um, we've seen different presentations about, um, you know, environmental impact uh, of preservation efforts specific um operations of preservation digital preservation so we've in the past also um kind of had this reading room type approach to our meetings uh we could possibly find two or three different um you know articles to review and then have a discussion or something like that um but yeah, I was thinking it could make an interesting thing for like reading up on it and then maybe having uh, Andrew talk to us about their decision process that they went through before they moved all of their content. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me volunteer okay. Andrew. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to do that since he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> That would be great, Stephen. I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> it's just no, I got be... through uh, seeing Andrew give that discussion at CNI. He yeah. just mentioned that that was one data point from his presentation, but I thought it was um, something people would be interested in. So I don't know if that was going to be part of your presentation that you were proposing. It's it 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 it, it could be, or they it could be, or it could be split apart. Um, mm -hmm. Because that that's that's a little bit more specific a topic than 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 the more you know larger larger stuff. But also we don't want to monopolize you know the, the calendar. Well, you can. I mean, <laughs> well, we'll definitely put the the uh, the poll up and um, send a link out. Uh, so, yeah, and. Um, I, it's funny. So Andrew has my uh, contact information too. So, um, yeah, if we volunteer him and he's upset about it, he can reach out to me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, he. Um, and I really do look forward to to taking a look at his presentation um, at CNI. Um, I'm gonna try to do that uh, uh, as soon as they have um, everything available. So that'd be great. All right, so um, yeah, we're almost out of time here. So I just wanted to open it, open it up one last time to see if anybody else had uh, had input or um, anything they wanted to mention. Um, and then we'll, we'll probably wrap up after that. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to see if anyone had anything else.
All right. Robin, do you have anything else you wanted to mention? I don't know. Happy holidays to everyone. Be safe. Yeah, definitely. Have, I had have one question. Oh. I don't know if this is, uh, um, you know, and a lot of the schools are misrepresented here and have uh, Twitter accounts. And given what's happening with the Twitter and Mastodon situation, I, I noticed <clears throat> that some schools are, they're sort of preparing. Like uh, I'd seen, you know, University of California, Santa Cruz, seems to have a, an official mastodon account and um i just don't know i mean they're not cutting over or anything but i'm just wondering if there's anybody who has some updates on that situation and what your institution is thinking about It does seem to be a volatile right now um, with the board of Tesla asking Musk to step down from Twitter. Um, yeah, I'm sort of myself, I'm, you know, like trying to prepare, get ready for like, okay, when can, if, if it's necessary, because it's getting kind of toxic over there, Twitter land, so. Uh, it's kind of a violation of the, the code of conduct uh, <clears throat> in our Sorry, institutions. I I think I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, could you um, so summarize? Twitter has, <clears throat> with the controversy about Elon Musk and <clears throat> the ejection of journalists and the promotion of... Uh, they're no longer enforcing um, a lot of the bans on hate speech in Twitter. Um, the The medium itself has come under some scrutiny for um, being in a place that's not friendly or not consistent with the values of uh, the institutions that we represent, many of us. So um, <clears throat> Anyway, I'm just wondering how, what state of preparedness people have engaged in or planning and so forth. That's all. Yeah, I saw um, Scott mentioned in the chat, saw this in a news, a news report, quote, one of his supporters tweeted that he already has the new CEO picked out. To which Musk replied, no one wants the job who can actually keep Twitter alive. There is no successor. Yeah, it doesn't I, sound very helpful. Hopeful. I, met, I missed that, Scott. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just commenting that it doesn't sound very hopeful. No, no. Yeah, unfortunately. It was live before Twitter. It's like maybe one less platform wouldn't be a bad thing, but I know people that have got thousands of followers might not feel the same way. Yeah. Oh, and thanks for the link, Stephanie. Oh, sorry, uh, Robin. I was thinking we should finish on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter disappearance, not a happy note. <laughs> it's a little bit of a downer. Sorry for bringing it up, but I actually do think there's a kind of a, it's going to kind of nice to look forward to a real progress in that in the social media space that um, who would have thought that this sort of would land in the lap of the decentralized uh, web folks, you know, here's a great decentralized application. I mean, it's got bugs, but it would be nice to see an alternative. So, yeah, happy holidays, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for bringing it up, John. I mean, it is an important discussion. <laughs> it does raise a preservation uh, concern because a lot of people have been wondering when these 
institutions don't take part in preservation of the content that they've amassed. And I wonder, do we have everything that came before Elon Musk preserved? Yeah, that's a good question. What's there? What should be preserved? What has been? Hmm. And uh, stuff no yeah. Is the Library of Congress, you know, did you know a number of years ago uh, make an arrangement with Twitter that they they got they were starting to uh, to to take on um, to take on the data. Um, I don't know how you know if they kept that up because I know they were they were really there was very significant scaling problems that they that they were having just storing it at all, um, let alone providing, the, you know, they had no plans whatsoever to provide any access to it because it was just, uh, it was just too unwieldy. But I, you know, I haven't heard anything about that in a long time. Interesting. That's fun to watch. I, I gotta go to next call, so bye everybody. All right, thanks, John. All right, well, it's great to see everybody and um, have a safe and happy, uh, holiday, rest of the holiday season, and we'll see you next year. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Take care.